darkest days of Allied fortunes, German submarine crews boasted that they would sever America from Europe and make the Atlantic Ocean a Nazi lake. But though they took a desperate toll of Allied shipping, they could not sink the strategic island fortress that guarded the industrial heart of North America, central pivot of the Battle of the Atlantic, known to the world as Newfoundland. Capital of Newfoundland and vital seaport is the city of St. John's, famous in every land where sailors are found. For four and a half centuries, a people have looked to the sea, drawing their sustenance from the world's greatest fisheries off her shores. And throughout the war, with danger lurking under every Atlantic wave, the Newfoundlander has learned better than other North Americans the lessons of Allied solidarity. But beyond his human enemy, he is used to a more enduring struggle, a struggle against the forces of nature itself. Cold Arctic currents which nurture his fishing grounds also feed the fogs that beset what little agriculture his land permits. For on the back doorsteps of every coastal village begin the barrens of the hinterland. Across these glacial rocks and lakes and forests, there are no highways and only one thin ribbon of steel linking east and west. With the interior so inaccessible, the people live mainly in some 1,300 coves scattered along 6,000 miles of coastline. In their rocky isolation, these settlements, called outports, resemble hundreds of tiny islands cut off from communication with each other except by sea. More than wheat to Western Canada or cotton to the American South, the codfish has been the one staple product on which Newfoundland's economy has depended. The sale of dried and salted cod, chiefly to the Latin countries of Europe and America, paid for her essential imports of food and manufactures. But in the Great Depression, her foreign markets vanished altogether. Half the island's population was thrown upon relief. As the country's financial difficulties mounted, its government, in 1933, called on Britain for assistance. The United Kingdom guaranteed Newfoundland's finances and appointed a commission to govern the island, composed of Newfoundlanders and British civil servants and responsible to the Dominion's office in London. But in common with the rest of the world, Newfoundland continued to suffer from the economic blizzard of the 30s. With the coming of war, Newfoundland's fortunes suddenly blossomed and she rocketed into international prominence for with Irish bases denied to Allied navies, she found herself the key to Atlantic sea power. But even more, she was the key to Allied air power, providing an aerial umbrella for Atlantic convoys and a halfway house for the bombers and fighters streaming to Europe from North American factories. Symbol of Newfoundland's new stature is the giant air base at Goose Bay in Labrador, leased to Canada for 99 years. 
Here in yesterday's wilderness stands the image of Newfoundland's future, founded on a new comradeship with Americans and Canadians. Far into Arctic space this cooperation extends, and as the lonely patrols go out to chart the source of Atlantic weather, they are bringing back a new conception of geography, a new vision of the North Atlantic region. They see Newfoundland and Labrador as the crossroads of the future, key link in a chain of global air routes, and served by far-flung weather stations, all united in a single common function, not for war alone, but for peace. And as that peace takes shape, Newfoundlanders are remembering the Atlantic Charter, which proclaimed from their very shores that all peoples should enjoy on equal terms the trade and raw materials needed for their prosperity. Recalling the lessons of the hungry thirties, they seek the assurance that they will never again be cut off from the fruits of normal trade. And they hope that the friendly visitors who share their wartime hospitality will help them in the constructive tasks of peace. For the islanders need capital to harness the water power that flows untapped in the hinterland. They need capital to find and exploit the mineral wealth that lies hidden in their glacial rocks. They need markets for their growing newsprint industry in a field of powerful rivals. Above all, they need markets for the high quality codfish from their new style quick freeze packing plants. Nature has seen to it that only by a fully developed economy can Newfoundland raise her standard of living. For more than any other country, she must rely for her daily bread on trading rights with big and powerful nations. With Britain, responsible for her government. With the United States, who has leased her bases. With Canada, her chief source of imports and her closest neighbor. For the first time in her history, the island sees before her a way to freedom from want and fear. She looks to the cooperation of her more powerful neighbors for a guarantee of the future, the future of the Atlantic crossroads, the future of Newfoundland. <laughs> <laughs>